how do we find wildlife to photograph? That's a question I got asked, hence why I'm making this video. Lots of viewers and subscribers asked me that question. Um, I think myself and maybe other wildlife photography YouTubers, maybe sometimes we give this impression that we just go out and we find wildlife and we photograph it and it's all really easy. Well, rarely is that the case. It's usually anything but easy. It often requires planning and sometimes some very detailed knowledge as well. So what I'm gonna do in this video is to break it down into sort of three types of places, three types of locations where you could be photographing wildlife. I'm gonna give you some tips on each one of those. And then later in the video, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail just to get you to think about how you can think about different uh, animal signs and behavior it's going to help you in terms of knowledge it's going to increase your chances of getting really good images number one is nature reserves and this is definitely something I make use of myself today I'm here at one of my favorite nature reserves close to home obviously the great thing about nature reserves is that they're, they're designed to attract wildlife that's really the whole purpose and they're often managed in a way to attract a variety of species sometimes there's management that may, may attract one specific species uh, maybe a rarity which can be interesting uh, make sure you visit during the whole year because you might find that different seasons give you different species on the reserve if it is a very open reserve like this one here then every time you visit keep an eye out for birds that are flying over because you might sometimes find they actually have regular flight paths that they repeat over and over again so that can be really helpful in predicting uh, for your birds in flight photography. Swans flying over. Hoping you can hear that on camera. Wow, mute swans. Anyway, next point, yes, the next thing with nature reserves is um, if you can make use of knowledgeable people don't be afraid to ask staff and visitors to find out more information so if you've got one of those little visitor centers then you can ask the staff in there they're likely to know quite a bit about the reserve and what's going on and even different times of the year they may even know there's like a, a tame bird nearby that's acting a bit differently where you've got some photo opportunities the same goes uh, for visitors as well so people are regular bird watchers walkers maybe other photographers on nature reserves in particular these people are often more likely to know local knowledge uh, that you don't have so again they might tell you a specific place where you can go to photograph something that you otherwise would take you a long time to find so don't be afraid to ask the worst they can do is say no just a quick shout out to one of my subscribers, Paul Baldwin. Uh, hope you're keeping well and I hope you're enjoying the video. On some nature reserves you are going to have hides, uh, like proper wooden hides that you can sit in, which are largely built for bird watching and wildlife watching, but they can also be good for wildlife photography. But sometimes these hides are in the best and not in the best of position. Occasionally they can be in really good locations for photography. So one example would be kind of feeding areas if you've got any anything that birds feed on nearby or perhaps like the water level for example. If you've got the right water level in front of a hide then it could be good for certain waders, could be ideal for photographing them. Uh, also you might get bird feeders. So look out on nature reserves. Sometimes they have bird feeders regularly stocked up and they may be near the hides as well. Can be sometimes near the side windows. So keep a look out for them obviously that's going to keep birds coming and you've got the comfort of the the hide and you've got a bit of support for the camera as well um, so definitely check out those side windows even if they don't have any bird feeders you might find that there's birds just hanging around there and you can get fairly natural shots do bear in mind as well that you're quite restricted when you're using a hide so you can't move around too much you can't change your background or change your light for example so that's one of the reasons I don't like to use hides too much also please do respect other people so other people are going to be using these public hides uh, whether they're photographers or wildlife watchers or families enjoying the day out so please be respectful of other people whatever they're doing Number two is parks and gardens. So by this I mean any of those publicly accessible places uh, that lots of people tend to go. Now these places can be really good for wildlife photography because the wildlife there is often more used to people which means it can be easier to approach and in some cases it can actually be really tame. So yes you are likely to be uh, looking at more of the common species, your common birds, common ducks, that kind of thing. But there are occasions where you can get slightly more unusual birds, uh, maybe even rarities which I'll, I'll mention later. So I would say for beginners particularly 
your local park can be absolutely ideal just for practicing your photography and being able to get closer to subjects without having to use field craft or highs or any of that kind of thing much easier to do and at times much more enjoyable one of the benefits as well that I find in uh, parks like this one is that you can often have uh, places to support your camera like benches, seats and benches, uh, barriers, fences and they can be really good for supporting the camera so you might not need to use a tripod, you can e more easily use slower shutter speeds, uh, you might want to use a beanbag possibly but they're really really good for camera support. Think about where the best backgrounds are, where the light's coming from, uh, backgrounds can be a problem in these kind of locations like this park, you have to often work much harder to get a, a cleaner more natural background because there's so many other things in there that can get in the way, it often doesn't look as natural which it isn't. In a lot of parks and ornamental gardens you'll often find trees with berries and they can be fantastic for birds, uh, your winter thrushes for example which will feed on the berries so keep an eye out for that uh, as we get into the autumn look for any nice colourful berries that the birds might be attracted to and again this is just one example where sometimes as well as the common birds you might get some more slightly unusual birds maybe red wings and field fairs and if you're really lucky you might even get some wax wings so sometimes you can get more interesting rarer more exciting birds even down at the local park in fact some of these slightly rarer birds may already be there you just haven't noticed them yet so like anything you want to keep coming back particularly if it's somewhere local to you find a park that's local to you find out what's there keep going back as often as you can at different seasons and I bet you you'll find new species every year and number three I've called this the great outdoors so what I'm referring to is just being wilder more out in the countryside not places where they're set up for wildlife and certainly not the parks and gardens so these are the places where you're going to have to do more research, you're going to have to learn more about wildlife in order to get close to photograph it. So if you're in a certain habitat, one thing you need to do is to learn what kind of subjects are you likely to expect there. Loads of different birds and mammals, uh, animals will be found in different habitats, they're all there for a reason. So you really need to get online, get researching online, even pick up a book, they still exist. Speak to people as well, speak to as many people as you can, learn as much as you can about the habitat and the species that is likely to be found there. Think about the signs. What kind of signs does wildlife leave? Well, you've got a number of things. So droppings, or poop we could call it, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if you find an area where you, you're regularly seeing droppings in the same place, then the likelihood is that 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 species is actually hanging around there and sometimes even with like some mammals for example they may do that in a kind of territorial way in the same place. If you're really good you may be able to find nests for birds and even like dens and earths for mammals it is possible. If you find those places then obviously you've got a much better chance of photographing the subject. What I would say is you need to be really careful in that situation and not cause disturbance. If you are if you have found a nest and you want to photograph near it you need to check it's not a, a schedule one protected space species uh, schedule one bird because it, actually, it is actually illegal to photograph to cause disturbance near to the nest so do bear that in mind. I think it goes without saying that you need a, a decent pair of binoculars if you want to really find wildlife to photograph then get out there with the binoculars and start searching that is the best way to do it. Little field binoculars are ideal because they're really really light they may not be as powerful but I find that you know they're good enough for me and they do the job just make that difference so a pair of binoculars is definitely a must not saying you have to be like the best naturalist in the world like David Bellamy whatever happened to David Bellamy and hmm. um, just try and think out of the box a bit more as well about you know where wildlife might gather gather and why so as well as the obvious feeding sites which is a really good one uh, and nesting maybe think about roosting for example is an area where one species comes to roost in the same place um, it's really good shelter there that can happen sometimes in the winter with certain owls for example they may choose the same same areas and some of the same trees to roost so try to start thinking out of the box look for signs uh, look for signs of, of kills like a bird of prey would leave signs of feathers that it's plucked a fox would leave similar signs but slightly different so look for things like that and especially if you're seeing them in the same area that can be a really good sign uh, Again, like droppings around posts, for example, could be a, a really good sign of an owl. And pellets, that's the one I, was, I nearly forgot about. Owl pellets. Other birds will leave pellets, like kestrels, birds of prey, crows. I'm sure other birds do as well. I know they do, but particularly birds of prey. If you find a load of pellets underneath a post or a branch in the same place, then it's very likely there's a bird of prey sat on there day after day. Also, there's other little things such as 
scrapes on the ground, footprints, maybe scrapes on trees uh, that badgers might, might make. So there's, there's different things that will help you to spot the signs. Driving around in the car can actually be quite useful as well. Like if you're just driving on country lanes, uh, you can sometimes come across wildlife by the side of the road. And there are places where you can get incredibly, incredibly close to certain species and photograph them in there in this way. Getting local knowledge can be really, really useful. So uh, it's a good idea to meet people and talk. That's obviously more difficult to do at the moment, but things like online forums, for example, they can be really, really useful uh, just to get more local knowledge. Uh, when you have decided where you're gonna go or what species you're hoping to target, then you wanna think about a few things. Think about what time of day is that subject likely to be most active? Is it maybe earlier in the day, later in the day? Maybe it's around sunrise and sunset, for example. Again, go back to the, um, the food Food source is one of the biggest things is is there a specific food source and that may actually change it may not be the same during the year it could change slightly during the seasons where that species feeds on different things does there if it's a bird does it sing does it display uh, what time of year does it do that if you know those things then you've got a much better chance of getting closer being able to photograph it during that period so there's different times of year again like uh, if we take roe deer for example they'd actually be active in their rut around August time which is a bit different uh, to red deer so the little things again the more you know about the subject the better uh, also people did ask me about working on private land which which this is one of the farms that I've been to numerous times over the years um, so I'm not going to mention it in this video I'll make a separate video about that about how I approach people and get to work on private land I'll do that in a future video anyway I hope you found this useful watch this video as well if you like these kind of videos please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and click the bell icon for notifications and I'll see you somewhere in nature sometime soon Soon.